We live in an age when it seems that there's a crisis of trust in our culture. It seems that we are very uncertain of our institutions and the people who make them up and what their motivations might be. And indeed, the research backs that up. The Australian National University has been tracking Australia's confidence in their politicians and the political process now for many decades. We are in uncharted waters. Record numbers of Australians no longer have confidence in the system. Record numbers of Australians now distrust the political process and the players in it. Just more recently, we've had the latest of a series of royal commissions of inquiry into various institutions, this time banking and the financial services. And we learnt that we couldn't trust bankers. Now, there are many trustworthy bankers, in case there are any here, but plainly, people were deeply concerned by what emerged. And you stop and think about this. When people are in relationships of trust, harmony and progress can be made. When it breaks down, harmony and progress are impaired and people flee for safety. If you don't feel safe with someone else, you'll look for the rule book and you'll look for policing and you'll look for protection. So it's a good thing we've had the Royal Commission of Inquiry so that we know what's been going on. It's a good thing we've got the 78 recommendations, new laws everywhere, new surveillance, new policing. But it's a tragedy that it was necessary in the first place, that people have not been doing what they should have been doing without coercion. So now we've got a great big battle as to how to resolve these things. You see, the law-based approach. But, Jordan, you've said something quite different. Uh, in the midst of all of this, what you have said is that the redemption of the world is not political. It happens at the level of the individual. That's not what we hear in the media every night there's a new scandal. It's we need more rules. We need more policing. We need more surveillance. We need a different party in power. You're not saying that. You're saying it comes back to the individual. Well, the first question is, do you, do you want that? I mean, do, do you want a more, a state with more regulatory power? Do you want a state with more surveillance? I mean, first of all, why would you think that that would be trustworthy when all the evidence suggests in the past that as a state expands its surveillance power, it actually becomes less trustworthy rather than more? And why would you want, you might think, well, I certainly want someone looking into your affairs, but I don't want anybody looking into mine. Well, good luck with that, because, you know, to the degree that I have someone, elect someone to look into your affairs, they're bloody well going to be looking into mine as well. And that just doesn't strike me as a particularly positive development. And, uh, practically, because I don't believe it'll work. I don't think surveillance states do make people more honest. I think all the evidence is the opposite. And then I would say from the individual perspective, it's like I believe that the, the fundamental, what we got fundamentally right in the West, because there is a number of things we got fundamentally right, even though we don't like to admit that anymore, is that the ultimate moral responsibility for the state relies on you. It relies on your moral integrity. And, you know, you can, it's not that hard to think that through. It's like, well, first of all, you have the right and the responsibility to vote. And we could say, well, that's not exactly given to you by the state. It's, it's something that exists in some, in some sense outside and before the state. It's part and parcel of your intrinsic value. Okay, so that's a decision that we've made in the West, that each person, regardless of their flaws, is characterized by a value, an intrinsic value, that's so deep and so profound that the very uh, regulation of the state itself rests on their shoulders. And that's really something. That's, that's why you have the right to vote. And that's worth thinking about. The, the first question is, well, do you think that's a good idea or not? Like, do you believe that we are, in fact, sovereign individuals? And then, well, let's assume that you believe that we are. 
because the alternative is some sort of autocracy, right? It's some sort of tyranny. It's, it's, the, it's the parsing off of that sovereignty to a bureaucracy or to some arbitrary form of leadership. And maybe you can believe in that and you'd like a strong leader and fine, but you, you want to think that through. Because if, if it's not that, then it's you. Well, then it's, if it's you and you have to make sure that the ship of state is sailing properly, then the first thing you might want to ask yourself is, what makes you think you're any more trustworthy than the people that you're, that you're despising or criticizing? I mean, if, if you are, well, more power to you. But it isn't self-evident that you are. And my suspicions are that it's not even self-evident to you that you are. Because it's a very rare person that you come across, if you talk to them with any degree of seriousness, you know, they're able to lay out a, a whole litany of, of ways they fall short of their own value, their own values, not values that other people are putting on them, certainly that as well. And they can name innumerable ways that not only are they not doing what they should be doing, so they're falling short of the mark in that way, but they're doing all sorts of things that they definitely shouldn't be doing, and they know it. It's like, well, are we going to put that right or not? And my sense is, you know, I wrote a rule in my book. Put your house in perfect order before you complain about the world, before you criticize the world. Well, what's the idea? It's like, well, you're the sovereign, man. If the, states, if the ship of state is listing and sinking, that's you. That's your problem. It's your fault. You're not doing it right. You're not educated enough. You're not awake enough. You're not articulated enough. Articulate enough. You don't know enough about history. You're not taking on enough responsibility. You're looking for other people to blame because it's convenient. And, and, and that's kind of understandable because it's the dispersal of responsibility. Who wants all that responsibility? But there's a huge price to be paid for it. The, the first price that you pay for it is, well, there goes the adventure of your life. It's like you could get yourself together and be the bedrock of the state, right? That'd be hard. That'd call on everything that you have. That would be your adventure. You're going to pass that off to someone else? And then, then what do you do? You've got nothing left in your life but triviality. And you can't live. I don't believe that people can live ethically, trivially. That's why I think the pursuit of the idea that life is for happiness is wrong. Because life is too difficult for that to be the case. Our lives are too profound, too characterized by suffering and malevolence. The world is too characterized by trouble at every level for happiness to be the proper solution. The, re the solution is something like a heavy burden of ethical responsibility. The, the kind that sets the state straight. And then in that, you find the purpose of your life. And so not only if you want the external monitoring and the surveillance state, not only do you sacrifice your privacy and invite all that invasive attention and lose your impulsive freedom, you lose everything that's profound about your life. And someone takes it from you. They take your destiny from you. And that's no way to live. That's just. That's the tyranny that we've struggled against in the West successfully for, I would say, in one way or another for, for, for a number of thousands of years. And with a substantial amount of success. 